Every day, 4,000 people wait for a heart transplant, but we only transplant 10 to 11 hearts a day because somebody has to die for someone else to live. We say that again, someone has to die before someone else can live. And we've been doing it that way for 58 years. We're trying to cure the number one killer on the planet with technology that is 60 years old. Why well, say screw that? If we can't fix it, let's build a new heart. How hard could it be? We're gonna continue our trend of uh, big swings. The next speaker is a pioneer in the field of bioengineering. That means she, she led the team responsible for creating the world's first beating bioengineered human heart. If you think scaling a business is hard, <laughs> wait until you see this. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Organamit uh, Bio, Dr. Doris Taylor. Go get it. My journey started with a spark of magic. When I was a postdoctoral fellow in Leslie Lenwant's lab in New York in the 80s, I saw something that changed my life, beating heart cells in a dish. And when I saw that, I realized I was witnessing life, and it was magic. And that sparked a 30-plus year journey to actually begin to fix broken hearts and ultimately to build a human heart. Why heart? Well, first of all, it's fundamental to who we are. It's a source of our connections. We don't say to someone, I love you from the bottom of my kidney. <laughs> and you only get one heart. And yet, heart disease is the number one killer of men, women, and children globally. One in three people. If it's not them, it's you. And yet, the only definitive cure for heart, end stage heart disease is a heart transplant. Every day, 4,000 people wait for a heart transplant, but we only transplant 10 to 11 hearts a day because somebody has to die for someone else to live. We say that again, someone has to die before someone else can live. And we've been doing it that way for 58 years. We're trying to cure the number one killer on the planet with technology that is 60 years old. So I said, well, I'd like to repair the damage in the heart after a heart attack so no one ever needs a heart transplant. But everyone said that's impossible because there are two rules of heart disease. One, heart cells don't divide, and that's been my nemesis. <laughs> and two, what's dead is dead. You can't revive dead heart. Why well, say screw that? <laughs> so I moved to Bill Krause's lab at Duke in the 90s, and we transplanted stem cells into the heart. And when we did that, we were actually able, for the first time ever, to begin to restore function to the heart after a heart attack. But it also really became abundantly clear that stem cells, which are like us and respond to their environment, were never going to respond to harsh, hostile conditions with no blood supply and nutrients and grow up and become happy, healthy heart. So frustrated, we said, if we can't fix it, let's build a new heart. How hard could it be? Everyone thought I was nuts. My colleagues said it was impossible. And that's when I remembered what my mom used to say to me when I was growing up in Mississippi in the 60s. She said, Doris, look around. Every day, every day, ordinary people are doing extraordinary things. So my mantra became, give nature the tools and get out of the way. Instead of trying to force stem cells to do what they didn't want to do in an unhealthy environment, what if we created the right environment? 
and actually let nature do her thing. So we tried something really crazy. We washed the equivalent of baby shampoo through the blood vessels of a rat heart. And we said, we're either going to wash out all the cells or we're going to end up with a pile of heart goo. I'm not sure which. It washed the cells out and left behind this beautiful acellular protein scaffold. And that scaffold still had its blood vessels, which meant we could feed anything we put there. So we put rat heart cells back in, and a week later, we had a beating rat heart. Grape size, but beating. That was one of my wow moments in life. And then we tried to publish it, and we got pushback. One reviewer said, that's absolutely impossible. Another reviewer said, that's not novel. <laughs> it took us a year to make the discovery. It took us two years to publish it in Nature Medicine. And today, labs and companies, hundreds of labs all over the world, now use our technology to make liver, kidney, lung, pancreas, you name it. We made the impossible common. Well, 14 years pass, and we only scaled up from a grape to a kiwi because heart cells don't divide, and we couldn't get the cells we needed. And during that 14 years, I had to learn an inordinate amount about endurance, commitment, persistence, and frustration. I had to become a schmuck. <laughs> the heart has to eat 24-7, 365. And I had to say to people, are you really telling me you're going to let a heart die because it's a Saturday? <laughs> We're trying to cure the number one disease on the planet, in people with names. And at the rate we're going, it's going to take us 42 years to scale up from that kiwi to a human heart. I don't have 42 years. And neither do the people who are waiting every day for a heart. So we used AI and robotics. And we actually now use bioreactors so that if you need a heart, we grow stem cells from your blood to the hundreds of billions, and we wash the cells now out of a pig heart, because that's most like human. And we store those pig hearts on the shelf so that we can pick one that matches your body. And I just happen to have a pig heart here. We call this our ghost heart. This is a pig heart. You can see it's pretty large. This is one of those scaffolds. This one would match something about the size of a football player because your heart is about the size of your fist. And I, I, I've seen football players' fists, <laughs> about like that. So today, we actually use robotics to take your stem cells and transplant them into this ghost heart scaffold. And instead of 42 years, we were able to generate the first beating human heart in 11 months. I was really stoked. I thought, great, now my company's going to be able to manufacture hearts. We're going to save the world. We're going to make a difference. Guess what? We got pushback. This time via funding. Now everyone says, come to me when you've transplanted your first heart. Or they talk to their doctor friend who says, oh yeah, that technology is still 20 years away. We have the technology. It's five years away if we have the funding. And every day we don't do this, people die. I'm not here to tell you building the impossible is difficult. Everyone here knows that. Or that it's a responsibility and a privilege. You all know that. 
I'm here to tell you that building the impossible changes you and who you have to become and how you see the world. For me, I've learned to build my own heart, to walk in integrity with my heart, to be humbled by what we're creating, and to learn to say I'm sorry and thank you, not only to the amazing team that's in the trenches with me, but to everyone else. And on the days when it sucks, and I don't think I can take one more no, I get in my car, drive to a store, park, and step out of my car to a paint blob on a parking lot that looks like a heart and go, okay, yep, still mine to do. (laughs) This is not a moonshot, it's a Mars shot. Because these hearts have to beat every minute of every day for the rest of someone's life. And that means I have to face every step of this with impeccable honesty. Because if I do it right, we change the world. If I do it wrong, we also change the world. It might be a heart, it might be a company, It might be an idea that someone's told you is impossible. It really doesn't matter what your impossible is. What I've found out along this is that it's not what you build, but actually how it builds you. Thank you.